Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Yes, well, they say uh, it always gets you in the end, so here I am again. <laughs> so, let's look at Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We heard from Frank just last Sunday that bearing false witness, which is to say an untrue witness... Uh, a lie is destructive to humans since we're created as God's image and God only speaks the truth as it tells us repeatedly in John 17, 17 and other places and since God is himself the truth as uh, Jesus says in John 14, 6 so he's the standard of all truth to lie is to deny what we are meant to be right. so Keeping this in mind, let us hear Isaiah 8, verses 11 through 22. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy, let him be your fear. And let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob uh, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. Should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? to the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness." Let's pray for a second. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this passage that we just read, it's a very interesting passage, especially for the purposes of this talk, especially since God here tells Isaiah not to be confused about a conspiracy. Now the dictionary defines a conspiracy as a situation in which uh, more than one person agrees in secret to act or work together toward the same goal. And uh, another uh, definition is a combination of persons for a secret or unlawful or even evil purpose. And very frequently, conspiracies are built around lies, the bearing of false witness. Uh, not a coincidence, of course. But in order to understand this prophecy of Isaiah that we've heard, you have to know something about the historical circumstances that God was addressing through the prophet. When King Solomon died, the nation of Israel split into two separate nations. It split into the northern ten tribes, which continued to call themselves Israel, and the southern two tribes calling their territory, which included Jerusalem uh, and the temple, they called it Judah. Both nations were sliding into idolatry, with gods of power and fertility, although Judah, the southern kingdom, remained less idolatrous for a longer period of time than the northern uh, tribes, than Israel did. In 745 B.C., Tiglath-Pileser III, 
a name I like to give when I'm ordering coffee or something. T. Goliath Pelasher III, who's also called Pul, P-U-L in scripture, uh, he became the emperor of Assyria. And he decided he wanted to expand Assyrian rule westward to the sea, which meant going through Syria and Israel and Judah. Around 731 B.C., King Pekah of Israel and King Rezin of Damascus, which was in Syria, decided to resist Assyrian rule, and they demanded that King Ahaz of Judah join their coalition's resistance. Ahaz refused, and the Syro-Israelis decided to make a, uh, uh, decided to attack him for that. And Ahaz decided he would make a secret pact with Assyria, hoping that this would give Judah enough favor to remain a minor ally state with Assyria so they wouldn't be totally dominated and taken over. However, to make a submission like that to Assyria would mean that Ahaz would have to recognize and submit to Assyria's gods, ultimately being a lot like a mouse paying a cat to guard it from other mice. And you can read the history of this, by the way, in 2 Kings 15 through 16 and 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 28, which both give the history of this. In the middle of this situation, Israel and Syria from the north really hacked because Ahaz didn't want to join their, their coalition and resist Assyria, which Ahaz correctly thinks would be stupid. So he says, well, I'm just going to secretly go over here and make a deal with Syria. And in the midst of that, God sends Isaiah to tell Ahaz that because God is in charge of history, Ahaz did not have to be afraid of the Syrians and the Israelis, which turned out true since Assyria wiped out both Damascus and Israel. But also, Isaiah was to tell him that he should rather trust God and not submit to Assyria and Assyria's dark gods in a conspiracy to secretly make a pact with a pagan nation. Trust me, God was saying. Don't trust a conspiracy uh, to trust a pagan nation. You should also be aware that Isaiah was sent by God to tell Ahaz that the coalition he feared would not prevail against Judah. Uh, and that should Ahaz not trust God's word about this, then this would happen, and I read to you from Isaiah 7, 9 through 12, which happened just before the passage we looked at earlier. God says to Ahaz, if you will not believe, surely you will not be established. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, a lot of people when they first read that, they think Ahaz was being all pious and spiritually and everything by refusing to ask for a sign. And Ahaz, of course, wanted to appear that way. But he was actually refusing to have a sign from God so that he could plausibly deny having a reason not to ally with Assyria, an action that was already in his conspiracy underway and that he was committed to. Ahaz was simply being a politician. God, however, knew what Ahaz secretly intended, and Ahaz was engaged in this secretly because he was afraid that the nations to the north of him uh, would find out what he was doing and mount an all-out war against Judah, and that Ahaz trusted his conspiracy more than he trusted God's word and promises. Um, God, therefore, told Ahaz that if he wasn't established in believing God's word, then God would send Assyria to destroy Judah in the future, which is in Isaiah chapter 7, 17 to 25. A natural and supernatural outworking of the sinful choices of Ahaz in refusing to listen to God's will and word. So that's the historical situation. Ahaz is trying to make a deal with the pagans because he trusts them more than he trusts the word of God that was sent to him through Isaiah because he was afraid of the northern tribes and of Syria. So with that in mind, let's revisit that passage a little bit. Isaiah 8, 11 through 12. The Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy 
all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. So here God contrasts the way of the people, those who reject God's word and promises, to rely on their own efforts and machinations, their own plans and conspiratorial uh, schemes, with the way that God wants his people to live, a way in this circumstance that means God's people are not to call conspiracy all that these people cause conspiracy, and not to fear what they fear nor be in dread. Now the word for conspiracy here in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word kesher, and it's sort of a pun, and the Bible is full of puns like this, because kesher, though it does mean conspiracy is its primary meaning, it also secondarily means an unlawful alliance as an act of treason. So by God having Isaiah say this to Ahaz, he's saying, I know what you're doing here, and I know exactly what kind of conspiracy is going on. Um, Ahaz, you see, looks on this conspiratorial uh, approach as an alliance, a sort of a mutual pact between equals or near equals, he hopes. But God sees it as a treasonous submission of Ahaz and Judah to the evil spirits that Assyria worships. Uh, Ahaz's conspiratorial alliance is actually an enslaving submission, and Ahaz shouldn't trust it either, God says. Isaiah is commanded by God to not view the conspiracy in the way that Ahaz and his allies do, and not to fear the things Ahaz does, not to dread what Ahaz dreads, for uh, Isaiah and the believing remnant are supposed to trust God's word and his purposes to keep them safe, rather than Ahaz's fear and driven actions. Isaiah 8, 13 through 15. The Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So God lays out for Isaiah here, why he is not to see Ahaz's conspiracy in the way that Ahaz does. Isaiah is supposed to recognize that God's holiness, God's personal character, is why his word can and must be trusted. So that rather than Ahaz's puerile and baseless fear and dread, God himself is to be the fear and the dread of the servants of God. God says, don't fear anything but me. All believers really need to do is to fear disobeying and dishonoring God since he himself who sovereignly controls our destinies and our lives guarantees his presence and his blessing on his people becoming their sanctuary he says their place of peace and safety but the passage goes on to say that God the sanctuary of his people also is and I quote a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, meaning both Judah and northern Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. How can God be both a sanctuary and a snare? 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him uh, will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. To be disobedient to the word is to place yourself in danger of judgment. This is not only true in the Old Testament. You just heard me quote from Peter, who was a New Testament guy principle was still true. It's still true today. As Jesus said of himself in Luke 7, 23, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. God, both in the Old Testament and incarnate in the New Testament, is a radically polarizing person. He is, as C.S. Lewis puts it, either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. And you can't have him on your own terms. He's all one way or the other. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which is he to you? In for a penny, in for a pound. 
A lot of people try to have that more than one way, but you can't do it. He won't let you. His presence and his person is so powerfully polarizing that that polarization is even manifest in his people, as we see in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. Now, thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who's sufficient for these things? What do people smell in our lives? My father's always said, and he's sitting out there today, my father always, always said that you know a person better by their enemies than you do by their friends, and his goal is to have the right enemies. Is your aroma drawing and repelling the right people? God is both sanctuary and a stone of stumbling, depending on who someone believes he is. Isaiah 8, 16 through 18. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. To bind up the testimony means to keep it from being altered. To seal the teaching, and the word for teaching here is the word Torah, same word for law, is to approve, is to put your seal of approval on it, as the disciples embrace and live by God's word. Ahaz won't wait for God's timing, which is one of the reasons God is hiding his face from Israel and from Judah. But Isaiah says he will wait for God's promise and timing, hoping in God. Isaiah realizes that he and his children are signs and portents in Israel since they are not afraid. And folks, in a society that is filled with fear, someone who is not afraid stands out like a blinding light. Channeling the presence, because they are of the transcendent God, among the fearful as witnesses of hope and of judgment, of the fact that God is both sanctuary and trap. Isaiah 8, 19. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Now, Isaiah and the faithful, having been warned not to follow the way of the wicked by fearing and dreading anything other than God's word, are now warned not to follow the wicked into seeking knowledge from the disciples of Satan, from necromancers, uh, the word here is obot, uh, like the witch of Endor, whom uh, Saul consulted in 1 Samuel 28, who had an ob, a spirit, uh, to consult the dead, and Yediomen, which is to say those who are inhabited by familiar spirits, we might say mediums, who peep or, or chirp like birds and mutter or groan or growl. These words all kind of mean the same thing. And these are approximations of the sounds demons frequently make when they speak through demonized prognosticators, which I've heard, possibly some of you have. Inquiring from the dead about the living actually means asking the dead about what will happen to those who are still alive. You should realize that the demons who power occult actions like these are all dead Nephilim from the flood. Believers are not to consult Satan's dark resources, but to seek guidance only from the true God who alone knows and controls the future. This is all to be contrasted with Isaiah 8.20. To the law and to the testimony... If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And this is the crux of the matter. Security, peace, truth, life, reality can only be accurately known in our fallen world by way of God's revealed word, since only God objectively knows the world that he has made and sustains, and he has spoken through the Bible. Any opinion, human or angelic or otherwise, which does not agree, which does not comport with what God has inspired and caused to be written in the scriptures, any opinion or view that contradicts the Bible is darkness, confusion, and empty, unreal fantasy. Anything that contradicts scripture is darkness, death, 
emptiness. You want to know truth and reality? Study the Bible. All right? The alternative to not heeding the Bible is laid out for us nicely for Ahaz and Judah in Isaiah 8, 21 through 22. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. To reject the word and promises of God brings distress, rage, and anguish with no help or relief from above or below the true cost of refusing to believe. So, pretty straight ahead, right? Don't pay attention or buy into conspiracies. Just believe God's word and trust in him. Simple, right? Well, yes and no. We tend to only look for the bottom line. The simplest answer Occam's razor. And it's always good to know the bottom line of things unified meaning. But that's generally not all there is to things, and there's a reason for that. Our creator, the one who holds everything in existence, is triune. He is one God, but he is also an equally three persons. He's not more one than he is three. He's not more three than he is one. His attributes, as the theologians say, are all equally ultimate. So God is both what theologians call simple, a single unified being, and he is also an equally complex, three diverse and distinctive persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. This simple, complex, one and many, unified and diverse God has created and sustains everything that exists to reveal himself. As Psalm 19, 1 to 6 and Romans 1, 18 to 21 says, he created to show who and what he is. Because he has created things in the world to reveal himself as he actually is, the things in the world are both simple and complex because they reflect the creator they reveal. God designed them to do so. And humans, created as the image of God, according to Genesis 1, and other places, humans are preeminently the part of creation that most fully reveals God, both Simple and simultaneously complex. The Bible, which is the very word of God, inspired by God's spirit through human instruments, God's voice is, of course, both simple and complex as he is. Both those aspects in herein and are part of the Holy Spirit-inspired and spirit-inhabited scriptures. To only expect and therefore to only see the simple or bottom line aspect of God's word is to act as though God is only simple, only a unity, a monad like the Muslims worship. But the triune maker is both simple and complex and his word reflects this. Hmm. So, in what way or ways is this passage in Isaiah complex if we have recognized its simplicity already? I thought you'd never ask. To answer that, we have to remember that the Bible tells us repeatedly, as it does in the history of Ahaz, that the world has fallen, which you can read about in Genesis 3, a truth that touches pretty much every aspect of our lives. So to answer this question, uh, one of the ways that we need to know is it affects us is how we view the meaning of the story of our lives. We're all storytellers. We see our lives in the world and God as parts of a story, a narrative in our heads. And wait a minute, you may be saying, I don't tell myself any narrative. Sure you do. Let's read together Romans 1, 18 through 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This tells us that everybody knows at least five things about God. They know that God exists. They know that he made everything. They know that he is holy. They know that they themselves are not holy. And they know that God is hacked about that. Right? Now, everybody knows these things bone deep. But 
It also tells us that men suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They try to keep themselves from knowing what they know, and they'll use pretty much any excuse to do so. Utility, well, that doesn't work. Evolutionary thought, well, we just came from animals. Whatever kind of excuse they can hold to, they hold to. But you see here as well in this passage that God's wrath is revealed because men refuse to give God the glory that he deserves and are not thankful to him. So they suppress and deny that the world is revealing God's glory. And then they try to attribute that glory to a created thing rather than to the creator. They lie to themselves. They bear false witness to themselves about who they are and who God is and about what the world is like. Now, the facts men know from creation assume a story. God made the world, including men, something went wrong, and now the Holy Creator is angry at unholy mankind. That's a story, a true story, by the way. And fallen men, however, to justify their evil, they change the story to all kinds of whack assumptions to try to make themselves the gods of their own story. And who we think we are, and what gives worth to what we do, and who God is, are all things our stories kind of tell us. For Christians, our personal stories must reflect the truth of the law and the testimony of the Bible, or our stories are darkened illusions, having, as Isaiah 8.20 says, no light in them. We lie to ourselves about what the world is like, and we act in accordance with our stories, with our false witnesses to ourselves. From those stories in the fallen world proceed conspiracies. We all know a number of them. We know real conspiracies like the assassination of Caesar and several failed attempts on Hitler's life and the successful killing of Lincoln and JFK and Martin Luther King and so on and so forth. There is a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. A reference to the fact that interesting histories are written about times of great conflict and unrest. And brothers and sisters, we are all living in interesting times. That's not a good thing, but it's a true thing. Right? And as a result, our society is swimming in conspiracy uh, stories and theories. Trump is a racist. Michelle Obama is actually a man. Numbers of political and entertainment celebrities have been killed by a secret tribunal and been replaced by clones. Bill Gates oversaw the genesis of COVID-19 to sell his vaccine and wipe out millions of people. The government created AIDS to wipe out homosexuals. Many of our le uh, leaders are really alien lizard people. Our society is systemically racist and so on and so forth. And scarily, some of these are likely true. A goodly number of folks just say, well, I don't really believe in conspiracy theories. And considering that a number of them are simply wish fulfillment or paranoia or such, there's at least a certain amount of skepticism called for. After all, men do live bearing false witness even to themselves, and they distort or suppress the truth. But we can't just toss out the possibility of, pos of conspiracies. Why not? Because as jacked up as humans are in the fallen world, we're not alone in this world. The structures of our society and our culture are also interpenetrate with angelic beings, both fallen and unfallen, and they exercise influence in human society as well. We're told straight up in Ephesians 6.12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And folks, all those names have to do with spirits who govern a particular territory or people groups and stuff. Those aren't just metaphors. They are living creatures. Isaiah mentions the angelic astral powers in Isaiah 24, 21 through 22. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They'll be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They'll be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The powers here, these forces, are linked to the human rulers together, human and angel, sharing in the punishment for their mutual shared actions of governance. Then there's Judges 520. From heaven, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. 
This is about the defeat of Sisera's forces. The stars fought. Angels and stars are connected in the Bible and thus in reality as we see in places like Nehemiah 9.6 and in Deuteronomy 17.2-3. If there's found among you within any of your gates which the Lord your God gives you a woman or a man who has been wicked in the sight of the Lord your God and transgressing his covenant who has gone and served other gods and worshipped them either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven which I have not commanded then it says they're to be put to death. And then there's Deuteronomy 4.19. When you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things which the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. Here the worship of the sun, moon, or any of the hosts of heaven is connected directly to the worship of false gods, which can also be seen in the fact that the worship of Baal is uh, connected with stars in 2 Kings 17, 16 through 17, as is the worship of Rephan and Moloch in Acts 7, 42 through 43. Now, Kemper, you may be saying to yourself, really, dude, don't you know that all this stuff is just poetic metaphor? Well, to me, that's even more amazing then, because you're telling me a mere metaphor can influence and control governments, societies, and people groups? I think not. Well, okay, then, you may be thinking, but Kim, you don't really expect me to believe this, do you? Well, no, I, I don't. Uh, I've been dealing with Christian reductionists all of my life, and I can't say that I do expect you to believe this. I generally don't believe people will, and it actually doesn't matter what I expect you to believe about this. There's no real reason at all you should worry about my expectations here. That being said, though, the Holy Spirit who inspired his word is truth and the son who died to allow you to hear and believe that word and the father who sent the word into the world, they expect you to believe it. And especially if you're a Christian, you should worry about God's expectations. Just something to consider. Salah. My point here though is this. If you are a Christian, you pretty much have to believe that there are monumental cosmic angelic human conspiracies. There is no way out for you if you believe the Bible. Welcome to the real world. Take the red pill. So how can you do that? Um, well, let's see. Uh, let's say this first. My point, uh, part of my point is that a conspiracy doesn't necessarily mean it's an evil one. But you do need to be able to tell the difference between good ones and evil ones. All right? and between true and false ones, to the extent that you can, and you need to act accordingly. So how can you do that? Well, Acts 8.20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. And 2 Peter 1.19, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We must learn and study God's word in depth in all its simplicity and complexity if we're going to see the world as it truly is. St. John Calvin said that the Bible is like a pair of glasses, spectacles he called them, which correct our sin-distorted view of the world. We must tell ourselves, because we're going to tell ourselves stories about ourselves, we must tell ourselves a true story about ourselves and about the world, and about God. If we uh, don't do this, if we don't gauge our lives and stories by God's word, then we are going to bear false witness and distort the truth into lies against ourselves, our society, and God. Sanctification, being made like Jesus, is not about judging God and his word by our truth-suppressive sinful stories, but instead seeing our stories as they really are through the truth of the Bible. We must let God's word tell us how to think and act in our lives. We must take the word of God seriously enough that despite the stuff we don't want to believe or that's not popular to believe or anything, that it shapes our life according to those things. If you think it's God's word, brothers and sisters, you better act like it because there are repercussions to not doing so. In the first place, you'll be stumbling around and be likely to believe all kinds of weird conspiracies and stuff like that just because you don't know 
what the truth of reality is. A lot of things depend on you thinking that people are unfallen. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are all seriously jacked up. And that in itself does with about two-thirds of those conspiracies. All right? You, if you believe that it's not just men alone who decide in governments and stuff like that, if you believe that there are uh, angelic forces and spiritual forces involved like that, then one, that should keep you from throwing out some of the conspiracies that might be true. Because you see reality in the way that it really is. Folks, the world is like the Bible says it is. And we're nitpicking through it looking for the simplest explanation of things when a God who is unbelievably complex as well as simple has given us his word so that we can look at the world as it really is, a world that reflects the triune God who is both simple and complex. There's a lot of reasons why people do this. Sometimes they're just lazy. I rejoice that in our church we're reading through the Bible. Some people, for the first time in their lives, are reading through it. And once you read through it, you need to keep reading through it. And you need to study it in some depth. If you think coming here to church and hearing the word of God preached for 30 or 40 minutes, or in my case probably longer, something like that, is going to change you and fit you to do what is seriously required of you and to see the world, you are dreaming, my friend. This thing we are doing is not a game. It's not a game. Right? Right? People have lived and died down the centuries to make sure that the truth was spread, society was changed, people come to Christ, and God's kingdom advances. And that's what you're here for if you're a Christian. If you are not a Christian, I, in the first place, meaning itself cannot be defended outside of the revelation of a Trinitarian biblical God revealed in Christ. And we see this in our society all around us as system after system breaks down and people are freaking out and desperate and all this kind of stuff because we've been in this mode in our Western society for long enough that it's beginning to unravel, right? And yet the Christians are all off on the side trying to nitpick little stuff like that and escape. Folks, not a game. Not a game. So, how do we judge conspiracies? We do that by the true story, Scripture, and its divine perspectives. But you can't even begin to do that if you don't freaking know the Bible. Right? Jesus said something interesting in Matthew 21, 44, about himself. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Men will either be remade as God wishes as they fall on him and smash apart and he puts them back together in the way they were always intended to be or they will be irretrievably smashed to atoms. And there's not a third choice. Everybody that is alive now, everybody that has ever lived, everybody that will live, there are two choices. Two. Right. We Christians, by the way, have no need to fear any conspiracy. God himself is to be our only fear and dread. So even if you find true conspiracies and stuff, you don't have to be afraid if you're trusting in the word of God. He is with us and he will be with us. But we are to be shaped into and by the commandments, including the one that says not to bear false witness, even to ourselves. There must be no lies, no conspiratorial slanders, and no bearing false witness to ourselves, God, or anyone else. We all need to be Isaiah's and not Ahaz's. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've spoken to us through your word. Drive these things home to us. We are grateful, so grateful to you. And we ask all of these things, Father, that you will visit not only the truth of who you are, not only that you are a God who judges, but that you're also a God who loves his people and who has died for your people through the Lord Jesus. I ask that we would remember this, that our lives would be corrected, 
by your spirit and your word. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurchtx.com slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.